Venice and New York. The former is a city in Italy, the latter in the US, quite far apart, but they share more than their love for pizza. They now share a sinking feeling because New York City, just like Venice, is sinking due to the weight of its skyscrapers. It sinks about two to four millimeters a year. Doesn't sound very much, right? Four millimeters is three twentieths of an inch. This descent is so slow, it sounds almost amusing. But experts say it's the very opposite of funny. New York's sinking is a serious problem. And it's an issue shared by several other cities in the world. But why is it such a threat and what can be done about it? Here's a report. This is New York City, the Big Apple. It's America's most densely populated city with over 8.4 million people. But do you know what else this city is home to? It's skyscrapers. New York is world famous for its buildings and it has over a million of them. Can you guess how much they collectively weigh? A strange question to ask, but stay with us. They weigh 762 billion kgs. That's a lot, right? New York City would agree because it's getting buried under the burden of its own weight. Correction, it's sinking due to this weight. And we aren't saying this, a study is. New research has been published. It says that New York City is literally sinking. Some areas are subsiding much faster than others. Like Queens, Brooklyn and Coney Island. Areas like Manhattan are sinking at a slower pace. Because their skyscrapers are anchored in bedrock and not soil. So different parts of the city are being impacted differently. But one thing is common. All of New York City should be worried because it's sinking between 2 to 4 millimeters a year. This doesn't sound like much, but this gradual descent is a big threat. It makes the city more prone to natural disasters and the downward force of buildings coupled with rising water levels create a big flood risk in the city. And this risk is only increasing thanks to global warming. Plus, climate change is also strengthening hurricanes, which means storms could be up to four times more frequent by the end of this century. And they could invite deadly floods. So New York City is not only sinking, but also unwittingly welcoming worse calamities. As you may have heard, misery loves company, and New York has plenty in this case. Cities across the world face a similar future, including Venice in Italy, Mumbai in India, Jakarta in Indonesia, Bangkok in Thailand, London in the UK, Lagos in Nigeria, and Dhaka in Bangladesh. Out of all these cities, only two are aggressively looking for solutions. The first one is Venice, which is sinking at the same rate as New York. But after years of dithering, the tourist hotspot has built seawalls, costing Italy over $5 billion. They're helping as of now, but experts are doubtful about their long-term benefits. So climate change still seems to be winning the long race. The other city is Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. It too is sinking, and at a much faster pace than New York. But Indonesia has a solution in mind, quite opposite to that of Venice. It has called Venice's seawalls a duct tape solution. So instead, it's building a new capital city from scratch, like the child who's about to lose a game and decides it's better to start a new one rather than persist with a losing cause. So where does all this leave New York? Will it build another Big Apple on higher and drier land? Experts say unlikely, simply because this sinking is not an emergency for the city, not yet anyway. But it's surely headed in that direction. And soon they could be in the sink or swim territory, quite literally. New York is often known as the city that never sleeps. And now it has another reason to stay awake. Tonight, we start with what's cooking in the U.S. Joe Biden is struggling with a major crisis at home, arguably the biggest of his presidential stint so far. If he fails to contain it, it will hurt the whole world. It will have an impact on all of us. What are we talking about? The U.S. debt crisis. Their government is running out of money. We've been telling you about this. They have a limit on how much money the government can borrow. It's called the debt ceiling.
That limit is a little over $31 trillion. It sounds like a lot of money, but the U.S. government has spent most of it. So now they need more money to run the country, to pay for their schemes, to give salaries to their employees. Where will this money come from? The government will have to borrow. But to be able to borrow, they must increase the debt ceiling. And to increase the debt ceiling, they need the opposition party, that is the Republicans, on board. That is the rub. The Republicans won't agree. They've had multiple meetings. They keep saying they're making progress, but they haven't agreed to a deal. And time is running out. The U.S. has one week to fix this. Some debt payments are due as early as the 1st of June. They need money for that, else they will default. In other words, the U.S. could default as early as next Thursday. Joe Biden realizes how critical this is. He cancelled his trip to Australia for this. It led to the cancellation of the Quad Summit. He rushed back home to meet the Republicans, but to no avail. The U.S. is now barreling towards a debt default. If it happens, it will be the first in American history. So a deal shouldn't even be a matter of discussion. But it has become a contested issue thanks to the divisions in American politics. Their national prestige is on the line. Their economy could sink, but Democrats and Republicans cannot resolve their differences. Yesterday, Biden met this man. His name is Kevin McCarthy, a Republican leader and the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives. This is the lower house of the U.S. Congress. Republicans command a majority in this house, and this is where Biden's deal is stuck. He needs McCarthy to sell the debt deal to Republicans. As Biden went into the meeting, he sounded optimistic. We uh, were optimistic we may be able to make some progress because uh, uh, we both agreed that we, default's not really on the table. We've got to get something done here. He may have spoken too soon. Biden's meeting with McCarthy lasted for an hour. They called it productive, but it did not yield a deal. I thought the meeting was productive. Um, I thought it was more productive than the other meetings we had, but we still have differences. We still have differences, he says. Fundamentally, this is about how the U.S. government spends its, its money and where it spends that money. The Republicans think the Democrats are overspending. They want sweeping cuts in the budget. Spending worth $4 trillion to be slashed. That's what they want. But the Democrats refuse to do this. Their offer is to keep the spending flat, meaning the existing budget stays and they won't spend a penny more. Now it's time for the other side to move their, from their extreme positions because much of what they've already proposed is simply, uh, quite frankly, unacceptable. That's where the deadlock is. Budget cuts. Republicans want them. Democrats don't. What is the way out? Kevin McCarthy was asked about this. What would it take to break the deadlock? You know what his reply was? June 1, the deadline, the date on which America is expected to default. That was his answer. It seems like the Republicans want this to go down to the wire. Experts are calling this impasse outrageous. Well, to be frank, I think it's quite ridiculous that we're doing this again, right? I feel like it just shows the rest of the world how dysfunctional our government has been over the last 10, 15 years. And, you know, in my eyes, we're playing Russian roulette with the United States credit. Playing Russian roulette with U.S. credit. That does seem to be the case here. American lawmakers are behaving irresponsibly. They are flirting with default, and this could have serious repercussions. If a deal is delayed, it will lead to uncertainty. Investors may choose to pull their money. There will be a crisis of confidence. This impasse is hurting the credibility of the U.S. financial system, and it's not something you can undo overnight. The worst-case scenario will be a default. If that happens, all bets are off. It's hard to really predict the exact outcomes. It will shake up global markets and trigger a huge sell-off on Wall Street. There could be bankruptcies. The U.S. dollar could weaken, and all this will have ripple effects across the world. Prices of commodities like oil could go up. Even wheat could become more expensive, especially for countries that import these goods and pay in the U.S. dollar. People who invest in the U.S. markets could see losses. Pension accounts with investments in U.S. stocks could see their corpus decline. The impact will be significant and far-reaching. But American lawmakers can't seem to see beyond their petty politics. They're willing to risk a default only to make the other side look bad. The great power rivalry is hurting the Pacific and the island nations are looking to India for some respite. 
India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi is visiting the region and everywhere he goes, he's getting a red carpet welcome. Today, Prime Minister Modi was in Sydney. Australia is the third and final stop of this tour. He addressed a mega community event and was greeted like a rock star. A crowd of 20,000 people turned up to see him. Our next report brings you the highlights. Before the Indian Prime Minister travelled to Australia, this picture went viral. That's Prime Minister Narendra Modi dressed like a rock star performing at a music concert. Before you say fake news, allow us to confirm this image was generated by an artificial intelligence tool. It is indeed a fake. But maybe this AI tool was trying to tell us something. Because Prime Minister Modi's celebrity persona was on showcase today. The occasion was a community event. It had all the hallmarks of a rock concert. A crowd of 20,000 people filled the Kudos Bank Arena in Sydney. There were cultural performances. The crowds cheered for the Indian Prime Minister and the Prime Minister made his way inside the stadium with his Australian counterpart, Anthony Albanese. Prime Minister Albanese was the first leader to speak, and he made a candid admission. To him, Prime Minister Modi's visit overshadowed a real rock star. I said to my friend the Prime Minister before, the last time I saw someone on the stage here was Bruce Springsteen, and he didn't get the welcome that Prime Minister Modi has got. <laughs> Prime Minister Modi is the boss. The grand event was a celebration of the India-Australia relationship. Prime Minister Albanese and his team went all out to demonstrate Australia's special relationship with India. At the reception, the two leaders revealed a plaque. Australia will rename a suburb in Sydney. A hub called Harris Park will now be known as Little India. The Indian Prime Minister reciprocated. In his address, he highlighted India's deepening ties with Australia. इसके बाद कहा गया कि भारत ऑस्ट्रेलिया के संबंध 3D पर आधारित है डेमोक्रेसी डायस्पोरा और दोस्ती लेकिन भारत और ऑस्ट्रेलिया के ऐतिहासिक संबंधों का विस्तार इससे कहीं ज्यादा बड़ा और जानते हैं इन सारे संबंधों का सबसे बड़ा आधार क्या है जानते हैं जी नहीं सबसे बड़ा आधार है म्यूचुअल ट्रस्ट और म्यूचुअल रिस्पेक्ट Prime Minister Modi followed that up with an announcement. He declared India is expanding its diplomatic ties with Australia. Soon, India will open a new consulate in Brisbane. The new consulate will cater to the growing Indian diaspora in the country. Prime Minister Modi's address had a message for the community. He hailed their contributions to Australia and called them a pillar of strength for the India-Australia relationship. A mutual trust or mutual respect sirf bharat australia ke diplomatic rishton se viksit nahi hua hai iski asli wajah hai iski asli taakat hai 
आप ऑस्ट्रेलिया में रहने वाले हर एक भारतीय वैसे मैंने सुना है कि हैरिस पार्क में चटका की चाट जयपुर स्वीट्स की जलेबी उसका तो कोई जवाब ही नहीं है मेरी आप सबसे रिक्वेस्ट है आप लोग कभी मेरे मित्र पीएम एम को भी वहां जरूर ले जाइएगा The grand reception highlights India's growing stature in global affairs too, a fact that the Prime Minister underlined as well. He called India's position in the world as the force of global good and a bright spot for the global economy. I'm saying this again. Today, the most important thing in the world and the most talent factory जिस देश में है वो है वो है वो है कोरोना की इस ग्लोबल पैंडेमिक में जिस देश ने दुनिया का सबसे तेज वैक्सीनेशन प्रोग्राम चलाया वो देश है वो देश है वो देश है आज जो देश दुनिया की फास्टेस्ट ग्रोइंग लार्ज इकोनॉमी है वो है वो है वो है आज जो देश दुनिया में नंबर वन स्मार्टफोन डेटा कंज्यूमर है वो देश है वो देश है वो देश है on the sidelines, Prime Minister Modi met with several celebrities and influencers. This included pop star Guy Sebastian and celebrity chef and TV host Sarah Todd. Prime Minister Modi's visit now sets the tone of future engagements with Australia. The Indian Prime Minister wants a closer relationship. He has spelled out two priorities, defence and security ties. These priorities are aimed at one adversary, China. Beijing has targeted both Canberra and New Delhi with military provocations. But the threat from China doesn't define this partnership. Instead, it's only reinforcing the need for like-minded partners to work together. Meanwhile, India is working to burnish its credentials as a pharmacy of the world. The pandemic established that. India sent life-saving vaccines and medicines to the whole world. But last year, there was an unfortunate turn of events. Cough syrups exported from India were linked to the deaths of children. Almost 100 children in Gambia and Uzbekistan died. India's reputation took a hit. The government swung into action. It came up with a more comprehensive regulatory mechanism. And the new rules will come into effect soon. All cough syrups meant for export will have to be tested. And this testing will take place in government labs in India. This will serve two purposes. Regulate pharma companies and allay the fears of importing countries. Not to mention, protect India's reputation as a pharmaceutical hub. Our next report has more. India's rise as a global pharmaceutical powerhouse is well known. During the COVID-19 pandemic, it stepped up to help the world with vaccines. India's pharmaceutical sector is renowned for effective medicines at competitive prices. But that reputation has recently taken a hit. It was caused by reports of deaths linked to cough syrups exported from India. Children were the victims of these faulty cough syrups. So the Indian government rushed to take action. And now it has come out with a new set of rules. From June 1st, all cough syrup exports will need to be tested. That too at government labs. Seven of these labs have been marked for testing. A cough syrup sample will have to be sent to them for checks. Once they clear the tests, they will get a certificate of analysis. Only then can these cough syrups be exported. It's a thorough process to ensure there's no compromise on quality, because lives are at stake. Last October, 
news of faulty cough syrups emerged from the Gambia. It's a West African country of about 2.7 million people. Reports said that some cough syrups had led to the death of about 70 children. The WHO issued an alert. WHO has today issued a medical product alert for four contaminated medicines identified in the Gambia that have been potentially linked with acute kidney injuries and 66 deaths among children. The WHO began an investigation. It turned out all of the cough syrups had a common link. Four medicines are cough and cold syrups produced by Maiden Pharmaceuticals Limited in India. WHO is conducting further investigation with the company and regulatory authorities in India. The investigations failed to establish a clear link between the deaths and the Indian cough syrups. But then came reports from Uzbekistan. In December, 18 Uzbek children died after taking an Indian cough syrup. It was made by Marion Biotech. It's a pharmaceutical company based in the city of Noida in northern India. In both the Gambia and Uzbekistan, the children had died due to kidney failure. The Uzbek investigation revealed that the cause was toxins in the cough syrup. The toxins are diethylene glycol and ethylene glycol. The same toxins were found in Indian cough syrup exports this year as well this time in the Pacific Island nations of Micronesia and the Marshall Islands. India had to act fast. You see, India has a $41 billion pharmaceutical industry. It's the world's largest supplier of genetic medicines. About a third of all genetic drugs are from India. These go across the world, from the Gambia to the US, from the Maldives to Micronesia. Indian drugs are everywhere. So India has to ensure the very best quality. The Indian government stepped up. In March, the Drugs Controller General of India raided about 76 pharmaceutical companies. 18 pharma licenses were cancelled after the raids. And now comes this mandatory testing requirement. It's a welcome step. Hopefully, it can help save lives. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with India. The Natu Natu fever has reached the G20 summit, the meeting happening in Kashmir. Actor Ram Charan made delegates dance to the song. In England, water buffaloes took a dip in a new private swimming pool in Essex. The owners of the pool have sought compensation. They say the animals have ruined their pool worth over $80,000. And in Guatemala, some cliff divers took their skill and love for adventure to a new height. And finally, what makes this day, the 23rd of May, significant? We're taking you back in history on this day in 1915. Italy declared war on Austria and Hungary. And with that, Rome entered the world war on the side of the original allies, Britain, France, Russia. Initially, when the war broke out in 1914, Italy chose to be neutral in the conflict. We're leaving you with that. Thanks for watching.
email exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colony. US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the colonial loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting.